not far from the sleepy Malaysian town of Ipoh. Nestled within vast palm oil and rubber estates that dominate the area, and bounded by magnificent limestone pinnacles, lies the restored remains of a most unusual dwelling. For almost a century, this structure has been consumed by the jungle. A frozen picture of colonization, an abandoned monument to the British Empire, and some say a symbol of undying love. Locked within its arches and columns, its bricks and mortar, lies the tale of one man's dreams, his aspirations, frustrations, and untimely death. A Malaysian enigma suspended in time and space. A building conceived, but stillborn, from a man who haunts the imagination, and it is believed, the corridors of the castle itself. Kelly's castle is as misunderstood as it is enigmatic. Its history is distorted by rumour, speculation and folklore, causing its walls and corridors to be shrouded in mystery. Its passageways are believed by many to be haunted by the man who built it and others who lived there. The spirit of the owner, they say, remains and dwells within the castle walls. The ghost of the colonial planter has been witnessed often wandering the corridors and bedrooms, displaying all the features of a master surveying his estate. People avoid coming to this castle after dark because it's believed that this castle is haunted. There have been a lot of ghostly images being seen in various parts of this castle over the years. Kelly's castle is not a place for the faint-hearted on a moonless night after midnight. A case in point is this part of the castle. Many visitors have mentioned about hearing voices in this part of the room. When they enter this room, the voices have moved to the next room. And when they enter that room, the voices have moved to another room. And when they enter that room, the voices have disappeared at the end of the building, down the spiral staircase. I cannot explain that. The most recent case was this European couple, a team of scientific naturalists from Canada. They came to Kelly's castle to shoot nocturnal creatures, especially bats. After their shoot in the middle of the night, the European lady saw a ghostly image of a man standing, looking outside the window. Was it William Kelly Smith himself? But she doesn't believe in these ghostly stories. But that's what she saw. Kelly's castle has suffered much from the exposure to tropical elements over the years. Most of the original building is in ruins and structural damage has had to be reinforced to stop the edifice from collapsing. Now with the insights and postulations of our team of experts, 
Kelly's castle can now be reconstructed and revealed in all its glory, and William Kelly Smith's dream can finally be realised. Chen Fun Fi is an architect who also writes books about Malaysian architectural heritage. He has a great passion for historical buildings and is active in the Malaysian Heritage Society. Dr Ho is a medical practitioner with a special interest in the history of the Kinta Valley. He's written books on the subject and has lived in the area all his life. Hello, Mr Chen. Oh, we finally meet. Oh, Dr. Ho. Chen Wun-Fu and Dr. Ho will lead a team to reconstruct the castle in 3D, and using their expertise and experience, they'll speculate on how the castle might have looked had it ever been finished. Yeah, you were saying one time you had played here as a boy. Oh, yes, so I used to come I want boy, to yeah. ask you about your childhood memories. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because there was something that we were not very certain about. Okay. Uh, did he intend to go up another floor? I don't think so. Or the main so. house? I don't think so. Uh, because I thought when you played here as a boy, that flat roof was already built. Yes, it was already there. Yeah. It was already there. I think somewhere in the literature, yes. it was said that he was going to hold parties there. That's possible. It would have been a very good place to hold rooftop parties. Yeah. You know? yeah. Of course, it would be a very a uh, pleasant place because you could see the landscape around that's, that's uh, right. at the that's top. Right. That's right. Then, of course, they would finish with a, a, a kind of balustrade, you know, along the roof line. Eh? That's right. Definitely the brickwork would not have been left on Yeah, plastered. it should be plastered. Yeah, should so they would have been more, it would have been unified with the glass house. That's right. right? That's yeah. Right. Uh, because as it, do, as it looks now, it's a very rough kind of brickwork. That's right. Yes. That's right. And also the other thing that most people don't realise, what we see today yes. on the main road, on the, right. out the other side of the river, is not actually the front. It's the back. It's that's actually the, the back. back. Yes. So that's the, the front. Is that's back. the front. Yes. And this will still be used as the front yes. to the whole complex. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And then the other thing that it has never been quite established is where was the main entrance because there is no sign of a covered porch, like a porte cochere, yes. which is almost an indispensable part of those old colonial houses. Where, if you had seen it in your child and your boyhood, would it have been on that side of the house? It would probably be in front of the house. But there was none when you came to play. That was after the war. I think it could have been destroyed during the war. Ah. How was it destroyed? Was it by bombing? It's very likely by bombing. When the Japanese first came over, they were looking for important targets, and this looked very important. Somebody important. It was the Japanese here. who bombed it, not, not the counter-attack when British... Not, not really likely. Uh, the Japanese. They targeted a lot of important places. Just randomly? Randomly. Places that mm. looked important. And Terrace House was probably good, big enough for very important big person. enough target. Big enough target. Which yes. looks important. Yes, that's right. I see. This is the whole thing. That there's a lot of guesswork. Oh yeah. When many people that's come that's here, that's, that's, that's because there are no plans. No plans, right? Uh, not enough pictures or photographs. That's right. So, unless there is extensive digging, right? That's to right. look for the disappeared parts, you know. That's right. It's, it's actually a place of mystery. Actually, all along. It, it adds to the mystery. That's yes. Right. Today, Kelly's Castle is a restored and maintained tourist attraction, one and a half hours north of Malaysia's capital, Kuala Lumpur, and serves as a monumental reminder, not only of the nation's British colonial past, but of the exceptional and perhaps eccentric behaviour of its founder, William Kelly Smith. Popular legend has it that William Kelly Smith built the castle out of a love for his wife, Agnes. In the same way, the Taj Mahal was built by the Mughal King Shah Jahan for his wife, Muntaz Mahal. He was born the third son of a poor Highland farmer in Dallas, Scotland, on the 1st of March, 1870. 
life was tough for him and his five siblings, and their impoverishment was to sow the seeds of William's ambition to climb out of his peasant class origins. It was a time when the burgeoning British Empire was seeking able-bodied men to grasp the opportunities that were being made available in the colonies. In the late 19th century, Britain was vibrant economically. But at home, at home, the opportunities available to the younger people uh, were limited. And the young uh, men in particular in Britain had to look for opportunities elsewhere. And since the British Empire had also expanded, so there were ample opportunities for them. So they went out to India, to Burma, to Sri Lanka, and of course to the Malay Peninsula. Lured by tales of great fortunes, William secured passage to Malaya at the age of 20 in 1890, aboard a ship that would take him there via the Middle East and India. The ship would have crossed the Suez Canal and stopped maybe at Port Said and Yemen. He would have seen buildings in the Middle East, then coming round to the Arabian Sea, down to the Indian Ocean, arriving in Bombay. It would have taken weeks instead of hours in, in those days. So he would have time to look at some of these buildings en route. From there, he would have rounded Ceylon up to Madras before crossing the Bay of Bengal to Penang. After a month at sea, William eventually disembarked at the port of Penang, ready to stake his claim on the undeveloped shores of Malaya. There were plenty of opportunities, especially for somebody from the British Empire, from the British Isles, coming to a colony. To, there were plenty of opportunities for them. Land was given to them as much as they wanted to plant rubber, coffee, whatever they like, you know. And then they could get mining leases quite readily. As long as they had the capital, they could, they could just start whatever industries they like. William worked as a civil engineer in his early years in the Kinta Valley, making contacts with local colonial businessmen and government officials. At first, he ventured out on his own, but didn't have a lot of luck. Establishing William Smith's civil engineers, architects and contractors, he secured a two-year government contract to supply railway ballast for the fledgling railway system and opened up a rock quarry. But he ran into problems with the legitimacy of the lease on the quarry land and had to abandon it without government compensation. The collector of land revenue wrote to him in a very pointed manner. I cannot see that the government is in any way responsible for the losses you may incur by you making an agreement with a man to break metal on certain land for which there is no title. William scraped along doing engineering work for railways and roads while he looked for his next opportunity. He finally linked up with another colonial, Charles Elmer Baker, who had concessions to build roads in South Perak. Perak became very important to the British business community as well as the Chinese business community in the Strait Settlements uh, because they had invested heavily in uh, the mining of tin. William struck up a business arrangement with Alma Baker, subcontracting the building of roads between the tin mines and newly erected townships and ports. Charles, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity of being your joint venture partner. I'm very thankful. So, uh, where do I sign? Just sign at the bottom there, William. I hope it's the start of a long and lasting relationship, Charles. So it is time for a couple of drinks, I think. Yes. With the profits from his contract with Alma Baker, William secured 200 acres of land at Batu Gaja. Like most planters, he went into coffee. However, from 1896 onwards, the coffee boom had passed its peak. Brazilian coffee became very popular. 
And Brazilian coffee practically killed our coffee. From 1898 onwards, most planters had switched to the new plantation crop, rubber. That was possible only because at the turn of the 20th century, America discovered the pneumatic tyre for the use of motor vehicles. It so happened that rubber was the raw material needed for America to produce pneumatic tyres. Over the next five years, he added more and more land to his estate from concessions granted from the local governor. He planned to mine tin from land acquired along the Kinta River, but lacked the capital for expensive dredging machinery. His rubber plantations generated enough income to get by on, but William was not satisfied with his progress. Then, fate took a morbid turn when after returning to Scotland to visit his dying mother, he met his future wife Agnes, heiress to a substantial cotton fortune. Charmed by the dashing young plantation owner, they married quickly and returned to Malaya together to start a family. But Agnes was unhappy with William's wooden house, as temperatures would reach almost 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the afternoons. When she fell pregnant, the need for more suitable accommodation became a priority. At that time, Kelly Smith clearly saw an opportunity in his wife having financial resources from a substantial expectation of a future inheritance of $300,000. And so, in 1904, he arranged with a firm in Singapore to advance her $24,000 a year for three years for the development of Keller's estate until the trustees released the money. Although it is unclear who he hired to design the castle, the architects might well have been the same as the Secretariat building. Jenkins, good to see you, my man. Do have a seat. Always a pleasure, Mr. Smith. Jenkins, I've been poring over your plans. They're splendid. Oh, thank you very much, sir. I particularly like the airy, cloistered passageway. Splendid. I'm particularly fond of that myself, yes. Mm. This would be no ordinary design. A manor house fit for a king, complete with stately grounds and secret passageways. William Kelly Smith was a man who dared to dream. The first thing he did was to build the new Callas house in solid brickwork, model on the Federal Secretariat in Kuala Lumpur. Kellis House was renowned throughout the Kinta Valley and beyond for its unique architecture, a creative blend of styles complemented by some surprising innovations. I am standing in Kellis House, William Kelly Smith's original family home. That it was substantially built, you could still see the base of these thick walls. His belief was to have thick walls to insulate against tropical heat. To assist the heat protection, he has introduced a passageway in the form of a veranda. This was necessary for Agnes' health and that of the newborn baby Helen, who was born in 1904 as the thick walls of the house gave some insulation against the tropical heat and meant that they could live on their estate instead of spending their time on the cooler hill stations of Maxwell Hill in Taiping or Kledang Hill in Menglembu, near Ipoh. What strikes me, being an architect, is the fascinating way Kelly Smith has combined various architectural styles. For instance, at the top of the wall, there's a trio of pointed Gothic arches in the inside, but masking it on the outside are Mughal pointed arches, showing that he has actually physically married two different architectural styles. Most interestingly is the window you see with the step heads. This was a style popular with the Art Deco style of architecture which came into this country in the 30s. So this was 20 years before its arrival. At the top, 
is a rectangular opening which would have led up to the roof of the passageway surrounding the courtyard, which eventually would have led to Kelly's castle. Then in 1905, they received bad news. The trustees of the inheritance would only release the funds in 1908. Not only that, but the Singapore financier could not continue advances due to non-performing loans in Indonesia. Kelly Smith had no choice but to turn to the government for help in a letter written by Agnes to the local British government representative of Perak in September 1905. In the letter, Agnes asked for a loan of £50,000, but the authorities were only willing to grant them a fifth of that amount. As a result, William had no alternative but to sell two-thirds of his estate just to stay afloat. To add insult to injury, William had his tin mining concession cancelled when inspectors found no dredging activity on the site. Kelly Smith was incensed at the attitude of the colonial bureaucracy. But the government authorities were adamant that no more than $10,000 be granted as a loan. The Kelly Smiths were in a quandary. They had recently lost horses and cattle to disease, and they still had to work their estate. By the time the inheritance was released, their grand plans for a vast tin mine and rubber estate had all but vanished. Suspecting that snobbish bureaucrats had been sceptical about Agnes's inheritance, William was determined to prove them wrong. The castle was thus conceived by William as not just a statement of wealth to be admired. He envisioned it as the playground of the local elite, whose acceptance and approval he so desperately craved. The Kelly Smiths were active socialites and were well known by other colonialists in the Batu Gajar area. They were among the top 10% of Kinta society. And actually, Kinta society was actually a brilliant society because remember there was a tin boom in Kinta and followed by a rubber boom. So many of the residents in Kinta were millionaires and they entertained very lavishly. And the Kelly Smiths were actually one of the top, top, top among the top 10% of Kinta society. And they entertained almost, almost regularly. Well, they would entertain their own sort of colleagues, you know. If they were miners, they would entertain other miners, or planters would entertain other planters. But most desirable people who could come to their parties were actually the government officials. If the district officer of Kinta came to one of their parties, it would be considered a success, and they would be accepted as part of the elite of Kinta society. William was a committee member of the Batu Gaja Gymkhana, and was commonly seen hobnobbing amongst city councillors and other plantation owners. With the arrival of Agnes' inheritance in 1908, William had grand visions for his estate. In Britain, in the Victorian era, it was fashionable for young, rich and enterprising gentlemen to build large manor houses, castles and estates. And for a long time, such practices were fashionable and well admired by the community. Thus it was that in tiny Badagaija in Perak State, William Kelly Smith was to have the only private castle in the country. A month after the initial survey of the ruins, Mr Chen is ready to present his designs to Dr Ho at the castle grounds. Here are some of the first attempt at reconstruction. What would have happened had he finished the okay. castle? All right. huh? yes. <clears throat> the corner tower, as we assume, yes. would have had an onion dome. Okay. The dome doesn't just comes up from a flat roof. Mm -hmm. It will be surrounded by some decorative balustrade and even have spikes on the side like this one, you see. Mm. These pedestals were ready to take these pinnacles. These are good, except they may have been a little bit more slender, like needles, because the stumps, the stumps are already there, you can see. Huh? But this, that is what 
happens with a roof parapet. You, see, you don't just see a flat roof. There's always a transition between the roof line and the sky. You know, one of the burning questions I always wondered was, where would be the main entrance to the completed complex, the castle and Kalas house? Mm -hmm. Both of them were in use together. Right. So one possible entrance would be from this side, where there's a, a remnant, I think, of a fountain, right? Fountain. Yeah. Fountain, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's a very common feature to have your circular drive okay. with some feature in the, in the middle, okay. like a fountain, mm -hmm. and you come through the port cocher, okay. where you, people get in and out during bad weather okay. in the dry, right. and uh, this road would have led out to the archway in the forest, yeah. huh? okay. which would have been the main route yeah. along drive in the, through the estate to this point. Okay. Okay. Unless you excavate a lot around the grounds, you cannot prove anything where one structure was or another part of the structure was. Okay. So, the best we can do is still speculate okay. and guess. Yeah. I can tell at that time he was using the, the kind of technology to build this structure. The holes on the wall surface must have been used as anchoring a framework of bakau timber, which forms a light scaffolding for the workers to climb up at various levels to construct the brickwork. Work started on the castle not long after the plans were finished, and it soon became clear that such a design would bring with it monumental challenges. Almost straight away, Smith encountered delays and obstacles in the building's construction. Materials were difficult to come by, so Smith decided to make them himself. Although he already employed a large number of Indians for his plantations, most were manual labourers and possessed no specialised skills in construction, especially a construction of this scale and complexity. Mandu, this is the plan. You're not following the plan. You must follow the plan as it is. How many times have I got to tell you? Follow the plan. The foundations and brickwork could be completed by existing workers, but the intricate finishing he was looking for posed his biggest problem. Well, we don't have the craftsmen here in Malaya to really do the job. We may have to go overseas. Hmm. Jenkins, I have a solution. We have to go to India. We have to import skilled craftsmen, sculptors and plasterers. Can you arrange? I'll get my best man onto it, sir. Jenkins, I know I can rely on you. We'll do our best, sir. Go to it, Jenkins. It had taken him years to reach this point, but on the verge of his dream, world events took a tragic turn. World War I erupted in Europe in 1914, and the wave of aggression had spread to the Far East. The logistics of sourcing the materials were now made more difficult, sea voyages slower and more dangerous, and the routes from Malaysian seaports to Perak, cumbersome and expensive. Capital was actually frozen in many ways. They couldn't get money to, to do many of the things that they wanted. And so actually, work on, the, work on the castle stopped for some time. They had to grow food, you know, actually, in First World War, they had to be self-sufficient. All the estates were encouraged to plant food. So instead of uh, just rubber alone, you see. So many of the, the workers were actually diverted to other occupations. The estate was not yet half built when in 1915, Agnes gave birth to their second child and heir to the estate, a son they named Anthony. The birth of Anthony gave new and increased impetus to the building's construction. But yet another global tragedy was to strike and further frustrate Smith's plans. The worldwide Spanish flu pandemic spread rapidly from Europe to all continents and was by far the most virulent pandemic in modern history. 
An estimated 17 million people died in India alone, 5% of India's population at the time. With the high levels of trade and the continued arrival of immigrants from the subcontinent, Smith's workers and craftsmen were inevitably exposed to the ravages of the disease. The sad consequence was the deaths of many of Smith's estate workers, and devastatingly, the deaths of all his skilled masons, plasterers and tilers, specially imported from India. A sad irony is that while India was one of the sources of inspiration for his dream and creation of his castle, it also contained the seeds of his downfall after the dedication of so much time, money and resources. Construction came to a halt on the castle site. And given the sad fate besetting the project, the surviving Indian workforce insisted that the gods be placated. Smith himself had developed a fascination with the Hindu religion through constant contact with the Indian workers. Saya dengar tok tok dulu dia orang cerita dia nak bina kali kasa ni dia ambil orang dari orang India dari nama membinakan kali kasa dia orang masa dia tengah bina kali kasa tu dia kena kena sakit teruk demam The scared workers implored William to build a temple to the deity Miriamun a gesture they said would help stop the sickness Dia dah siap kerja tokong ini, pekerja pun dah selamat. Dia sambung balik, dia, peke, dia buat keli kasa ini, sudah okey balik sekarang. By 1920, the pandemic had subsided. Convinced the temple's construction had protected them from the disease, the surviving Indian labourers carved a stone effigy of Kelly Smith amongst the deities on the roof of the temple. This is a good example of a multifoil motif from the Mughal architecture, but used in a triangle opening, unusually, because the multifoil usually appears in a half round or a horseshoe arch. These bricks are cantilevered out to form the springing of the arch. These are fine examples of the Mughal horseshoe arch with the timber frame fitted into the opening using doorways and windows throughout the castle. Eventually, work started on the first floor. The four bedrooms were connected by a cloistered balcony and featured secret passageways from the children's bedrooms to the ground floor. The walls featured elegant and ornate neoclassical friezes designed to frame works of art. Finishing of the rear facade had begun and a four-storey tower designed to house a hydraulic lift was taking shape. And as he set sail in 1926 to collect the lift shaft, the castle was nearing completion. The brickworks were almost finished and the plastering was well advanced. His dream of building a grand castle in an exotic land was almost realized. 
But alas, just as the end was in sight, William contracted pneumonia en route back to Malaya and died in Lisbon, Portugal at the age of 56. Agnes didn't want to come back to Malaya anymore. She sold the remaining part of the estate to Quinta Kellas estate. And uh, it, in fact, the castle was sold along with the estate, but the new management was not interested in a half completed castle. So they neglected it and left it to the elements. Did William really build his castle for his beloved wife, Agnes, as the legend tells? Or was he driven by a desperate desire to climb the social ranks and prove his detractors wrong? Did love build the castle walls? Or was it one man's ego and pride? For over 80 years, the castle has held a colourful place in the folklore of the Batu Gaja community. It seems everyone has a story to tell about the iconic ruins. I remember coming here as a kid in the 1950s. I would come here with my friends. We would cycle here, park our bicycles across the river or on our side of the river. Somebody would swim across with a rope and then we all cross over one by one. This place was different then. The whole place was covered with trees. The castle was all grown with creepers. We would have a great time running around in the rooms, the corridors, on the rooftop. It was great fun. Over time, the, the idea grew that, that, uh, that it was actually haunted, you know. People were, not, were afraid to go there. And uh, actually, when people went there, they, they would leave after dark. You know, it was, it was so dark there. It was pitch black, in fact and nobody dared to stay around. and So the legend just grew. As boys, we wanted to explore the tunnel, which started from the cellar to the temple. It was so dark, and we were scared of snakes, and it was flooded. Who would dare to go in? So we left it as that. We never, never dared to venture inside. This place is full of ghostly stories. I personally know of a lady who will come here every Friday night to pray, maybe to communicate with the spirits and hope to get some numbers. And the next morning, Saturday morning, the taxi driver will come and pick her up. She will go home and hope to strike it rich by buying those numbers. But so far, I've not heard of a striking rich. But some people vouch that they did see apparitions at night, at night, you know? So it might be true. It probably, there might be some truth to it. I'm not sure. <laughs> this was not only an exciting place to visit, but also a dangerous place. There used to be crocodiles in the river. And when we cross, we have to look out for crocodiles. Sometimes you see a log coming by, please be careful. And we do come here for fishing. And when we see the reeds moving, all of us will run. We don't want to be swallowed up by the crocodiles. While the 3D team has been busy building the castle from Chen's designs, Dr. Ho has made a breakthrough that will turn the entire enterprise on its head. By sheer luck, a directly descended relative of Williams visited the castle, providing our researchers with a valuable link to the family. A few phone calls and some fossicking in dusty English attics uncovered photographs thought to have been lost some time ago. Oh, yeah. wow, look at that. Yes. Now it answers all our questions about where yeah, was located the main entrance, you know? That's right. That's why I've always suspected that the driveway would lead up to a port cochere. Okay, you know? it is there. Yeah, there okay. it is. It uh, answers 
all our questions now about the main entrance, how it was used. Yes. And uh, this is the plaster work, isn't it? That's right. That was meant to be plastered. Yes. You see, with a, and then they would have gone over it with a color wash, most likely a lime wash in ochre, which was a very standard color used in those days. And then the trim again, the plaster trim would be le highlighted in white. The photographs have helped illuminate a wholly remarkable structure and given a far greater understanding of William's complete vision. Kelly Smith was a total grasp of the motifs, you know, okay. and the uh, language of the Mughal architecture, right. even though he was just a layman and not a professional architect. Yes. I'll take my hat off him. Mr Chen, would it be a good idea if the authorities now were to plaster the uncompleted Kelly's castle? So that you know, it looks. There would be two. Like I think there would be two schools of thought. Okay. One would say, historically, it was left like this. You should leave it like this. Another school would say, look, we have, we have evidence. We have all the evidence. We have yeah, right. how, all the evidence of how he would have finished the building. That's so right. So why not we do it? That's right. We can use this now to correct all our reconstruction, as it were. That's this right. will give us the true house and the features. That's right. Yeah. Yes which means that a lot of the previous work was wasted. Uh, Quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had seen this much earlier. That's right, but it's yes. not too late. It's, because, uh, these are fantastic photographs. Yes, yes. Now for the first time, William Kelly Smith's dream comes to life. The two buildings were to be connected to form a single compound featuring an open rectangular courtyard in the centre. The completed plasterwork unifying Kelly's house with the rest of the castle. It was to be a truly imposing structure with a final height of over 70 feet to the top of the lift shaft dome. The domes themselves would most likely have been cast in copper, surrounded by an ornate balustrade. A pinnacled wall would have extended all the way around the rooftop to allow the Kelly Smiths to conduct parties with a glorious view of the Kinta Valley. Cloistered verandas encircled the structure, providing protection from the tropical heat. And a port cochet provided shelter for guests arriving during the monsoon season. Fully completed, there is no doubt that Kelly's castle would have drawn the respect and envy of all Kelly's contemporaries and stand as a unique statement of a man's eccentric vision. A grand castle estate rising out from the jungle of Malaya. The story of Kelly's castle is far from over. As an attraction for visitors, it's a quirky landmark for the state's tourism industry. There's even been talk of restoring the building to its former glory and convert it into a boutique hotel and restaurant complex. We have no doubt that we have a priceless architectural gem which combines the styles from both east and west. We have therefore to protect, maintain and conserve this piece of architectural heritage for future generations to come. Kelly Smith was a man of vision. From humble rural origins, he stamped his mark on the history of a far-flung and exotic land. Ambitious and proud, industrious and perhaps a little vain, William struggled through adversity and derision to build a stirring and idiosyncratic monument in the jungle. William Kelly Smith was a prime example of the early colonial pioneers who came to this country towards the end of the 19th century. Eventually, he was to become one of the most influential planters here in Bargaja, Para. Although his tragic and sudden death prevented him from fully realizing his vision, his legacy lives on in this impressive structure. Much of the truth about his life and work has been lost down the decades since 
and the line between truth and myth has been blurred. Whatever the truth, tales of apparitions wandering the castle grounds will no doubt continue to be told, adding to the castle's story. And if you're very lucky, while visiting the castle on a clear, moonless night, you might just catch a glimpse of the Scottish planter as he surveys his estate from the window of the castle. <laughs>